What up, YouTube? I am rusty, but uh, that's okay. Taking about a uh, year and a half to two years off, uh, which is customary for me actually to take about five years off, but uh, took some time off. I'm not going to say that I'm back because I'm probably not back. Uh, but I did uh, sell off some gear, some of which I regretted selling, and I uh, was fortunate enough to reacquire one of those pieces, which is my T Rock TS1. And I have that here today. Uh, so I figured, why not go ahead and put out another unplanned, unproduced, so called instructional video on some topic that maybe 30 people would be interested in? Because that's what I enjoy doing. Uh, so, wanted to go over uh, the lead style of Eric Johnson <clears throat> between the time period of maybe the late 80s and the mid 90s. Now, I know that the lead style of Eric Johnson has been covered. But we're going to take things a step further. We're going to break down um, uh, not how he composed solos, <clears throat> but how he thought from an improvisation perspective. <clears throat> and uh, this will help anyone who is interested in uh, transcribing some of his work for themselves uh, know where to start, okay, conceptually. <clears throat> so when, when I think about his, his lead work, there's the improvisation, and then there's the, we'll say, uh, composition. Now, uh, obviously anything that he does live is going to be improvised. So there's typically a framework that you see him stay within, at least during that era, when he was improvising. There were things that he was comfortable with. There were things he could pull off mechanically, technically. Um, uh, ideas and motifs that he could recycle um, and, and change ever so slightly to make it sound different from one song to the next. But you would see those. <clears throat> uh, uh, there would be a lot of continuity uh, among those ideas uh, in his live shows. <clears throat> and then when he recorded Avi Music on, you'd hear some of that carry over. Desert Rose is a great example, and we'll cover that here, of where, I believe, he improvised those solos in different takes, then spliced the takes together into what you hear on the record. But it was improvised. And then you've got his composed stuff, and when I think of Venus Isle, I think he composed a lot of that stuff. you got solos like Venus Isle, Lonely the Night, Incredible solos, arguably perfect in, in, in composition. And, uh, uh, and when you think about how he pulled those off and some of the uh, finger positions that would have been required, the dexterity involved, um, and just sonically the character of some of those passages, <clears throat> very unlike anything that, that we heard him play live. So very unlikely that those ideas were improvised. Um, it would be very unusual to see a guitar player leave his or her box to play something that outside at that speed with that amount of clarity at that day and age when you when you were recording things to tape and you had to get it right unless you wanted to splice a whole bunch. Uh, so I think uh, fair to say a lot of that stuff was was uh, composed. Now one's not better than the other per se, but when um, when you have an understanding of how a guitar player thinks, <clears throat> um, and uh, it, then you have an understanding for um, how to, how to break their music down, which is how I've um, really learned to transcribe so much of the stuff that I have, okay? So there's really no secret there. <clears throat> once, um, once you understand uh, what it's likely that they're doing and you understand the mechanics of how they're pulling it off, you, you probably are going to figure it out in pretty short order, okay? So <clears throat> we'll, we'll look at a couple of different examples uh, of... of um, how he improvised uh, at, during that era and constructed his solos as a result of that imp improvisation. And to me, there are really three fundamental characteristics of his lead playing during that time. One, his ascending work, primarily arpeggios. Two, his descending work, primarily pentatonics. And three, uh, when he played those pentatonic passages, typically every note was picked, but not using alternate picking, and not using hybrid picking, but using economy picking. So I know Troy Grady put out an amazing video about downward pick slanting, and I'm sure Eric used downward pick slanting because most guitar players that play fast either have their pick slanted down or up. Okay, one of the two or some variant thereof. Um, but uh, economy picking was a bigger part of how he pulled those runs off than downward pick slanting. Downward pick slanting would still require you to alternate pick every note. It's the combination of, of 
alternate picking and sweep picking, which is accounting picking that allows you to play those passages at speed, okay? So those are really the three pieces, ascending arpeggios, descending pentatonics, and then accounting picking, okay? So good, good place to start maybe is Cliffs of Dover. Um, that intro solo is, uh, I think, a really good example of how all these ideas play out. So you got this passage here, and I'll play it slow. Okay, that's all pentatonic, with the exception of this note, used as a passing note. All pentatonic. <clears throat> uh, moving through, and this was customary of his playing too, it still is, different positions of the pentatonic scale. So if we think about this being an E minor pentatonic, you've got the positions. Okay, so we start in the third position. Slide to the second. Move to the first. And we're pulling this off, <coughs> uh, no pun intended, using a few pull-offs, hammer-ons and pull-offs, like, okay? But this is all a county picked. Now, what do I mean by that? So if we've got the five note groupings that he's so famous for, one, two, three, four, five, 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 for example, okay? Rather than going down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, down, whatever, alternate picking, it's down, up, down, up, down, sweep, down, up, down, up, down, sweep, down, up, down. So, down, up, down, up, down, down, up, down, up, down, two successive downs together, so on and so forth. And you're sweeping through that motion. And that's how you pull it off cleanly at speed. And I think that's one of the key changes you see um, if you look at his playing today versus then. He doesn't necessarily, rarely, actually alternate pick all of these descending pentatonic passages anymore. He's typically <clears throat> uh, utilizing legato and he's pulling off a lot. And it sounds different as a result. So the key to to pulling this stuff off and making it sound like he made it sound is to pick every note and you're going to have to, unless you're Steve Morse, uh, use pen, uh, counter picking to, to do that at speed. Okay? A little sloppy, but you get the idea, okay? Now, um, to further my point, now he's ascending and what is he doing? Okay, uh, arpeggios, those are string skipped arpeggios. So you're all familiar with the string skip, the string skipping that he's so famous for. Um, and, and look, he'll string skip <clears throat> uh, descending lines, he'll string skip just to move around from one kind of lick to the next, but typically string skipping is reserved for ascending lines and um, in strings, uh, you, you know, in this case, he's outlining a chord, it would be like a major six. So C, major sixth, major third. Okay, um, those are arpeggios. <clears throat> I'll show you some other um, ways that he uses arpeggios and ascending lines here shortly, where we'll talk about another example. But then to round out the, the, the idea here, um, okay, whatever, that's kind of more or less a static idea. Um, so, yeah, look, I mean, that's economy picked and that's uh, pentatonic and it's descending, okay? Um, so sometimes two notes per string, sometimes three notes per string. How he transitions from one um, grouping to the next, when we think about like the scale groupings, the positions, uh, could, be, could be a pull off, could be a slide. Uh, but he gets there using one or two notes per string, and again, you know, maybe he slides down that position. Maybe it's something like that. Uh, so we'll move on, and we'll talk about another example where throughout this solo, ascending lines were arpeggios, descending lines were pentatonics, and he used a common picking. Okay, so Desert Rose, uh, again, I think largely improvised, starts out with a descending run, 
there's a, a very short three note ascending piece followed by a descending run. Now it's hexatonic. Most of his pentatonic playing is actually hexatonic, which means he has another note. <clears throat> if we're talking about Desert Rose in the key of F minor, uh, he's adding a second, which is a G. Okay, and that gives it some more color. Um, I think it uh, makes it more melodic and, and gives you a little more feeling there. Uh, but nevertheless, that's the first run. And that doesn't sound pentatonic, but trust me, it's all pentatonic other than that one note. And then he ascends. So descending, pentatonic. That's an arpeggio. Ascending arpeggio. Descending pentatonic. Ascending arpeggio. Descending pentatonic and economy picked, okay? Down, up, down, up, down, down, up, down, up. All right, get it? Ascending arpeggio. Descending more or less pentatonic. Descending, you guessed it, pentatonic. Ascending. Arpeggio. Arpeggio again. Ascending arpeggio. So anyways, I'm very rusty, but you get the idea. Now, we'll talk about some of these odd note groupings. Um, so, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay? So, not just fives, a lot of weird stuff in there. Um, the second solo. Uh, we'll skip some of that and maybe just pick up here. Now here's an example where he doesn't use a pentatonic scale to descend. But he is going back to ascending using arpeggios. All of those are essentially arpeggios. Again, there are, in this last case here, it's a combination maybe of a short pentatonic passage, quickly followed by a major arpeggio, and I think finishing with a, maybe a minor arpeggio there. Uh, and that's essentially the same lick he played on Clissa Dover. Uh, I think, uh, what would it have been? That one, right? Uh, basically the same thing. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, now, descending. You guessed it. Pentatonic, or in this case, hexatonic, because it starts on this second. And very, economy picked, odd no groupings. I, I don't even want to get into the no groupings of that one. I think it's. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe. Something like that. Anyways. Um, 
need to practice. Um, so that's that. Uh, and then ascending. It's a little string skipping. Pentatonic descending. Ascending arpeggio. Descending arpeggio. Uh, now here's an example where he ascends and I think only there's one arpeggio at the end. So you get it. <clears throat> That's the concept. Uh, okay, now Venus Isle is another solo <clears throat> that largely adheres to um, these principles with some exceptions. So we start the solo off, and it's an ascending run. It's not, uh, it's not an arpeggio, <clears throat> uh, but it's not pentatonic either. It's really more of a, functionally it plays kind of like Mixolydian, but it is a or physically it plays kind of like a Mixolydian passage, but I believe it's Phrygian dominant. And it's Phrygian dominant really because of, you know, the context of what's being played under it. And then we have a series of, arpe of arpeggios. Ascending. I'm, I'm talking through this, but arpeggio, and that's really a mix of uh, we'll call it. Um, our, it's pentatonic with some uh, Phrygian dominant flair. Okay, um, uh, we already covered that. Obviously, that's an arpeggio. And then this part would actually play down here. You tap at the 12th fret. Um, uh, I think that's more than likely what he did. He could have used his prescription electronics experience pedal. Pretty sure he tapped it. Because during that era, 93, when he would have been recording this, you look at clips like SRV from Woodlands, he's doing a lot of that stuff. And uh, there's a Red Rock show um, where... Uh, oh, you, actually that has been released. So the Highlanders from... <clears throat> from the Red Rock show uh, that's on Eric's page uh, shows him doing the same thing uh, during that solo, okay? But um, Now here's a cool descending passage where he breaks the rules and he does an arpeggio, kind of like he did um, in uh, uh, Desert Rose. Now I think a lot of people play that like something like that, but then he goes back to ascending using You guessed it, arpeggios, descending, what do you think he's doing? Pentatonic, switching positions, fourth, third, second to first, actually that might be He's doing all the, he's, he's, he's actually going all the way up to the first, so he's going down really a full octave, I guess. Getting there a number of different ways, sometimes sliding, sometimes using three notes per string. 
Now here's a pattern. Where he does both arpeggios and pentatonics. Ascending, what do you think he's doing? You get it. So that's that. That's pretty much what he's doing. I could go over a number of other examples, but we're way over time. So there you have it. Use those three basic concepts as a starting point and um, you'll, be, you'll be there.